Hello and welcome. My name is Matt Petravers. I'm the director of the Morell Center for Legal and Political Philosophy here at the University of York. I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's event, The Tyranny of Merit, which is part of a series of events taking place today under the theme of democracy, debate and disagreement with the support of the Morell Center for Legal and Political Philosophy. I'm sure you'll enjoy this event and I hope you will join us for the next two events in the day, The Future of Liberalism and News, Fake News and Calling It Out. You can find out more details at yorkfestivalofideas.com. It is my great pleasure to welcome our chair for today, Sarah Montague. Sarah began her BBC career in 1997 as a presenter on News 24 and has presented many of the BBC's news and current affairs programmes, including Newsnight and BBC Breakfast. She has also been a regular presenter of BBC World's Hard Talk for 20 years. Sarah began presenting the Today programme regularly in 2001 and has reported and presented documentaries and series for Radio 4, including The Educators, Kathy Come Home and Wreath Revisited. So it's an enormous pleasure to welcome her and Sarah, over to you. Matt, thank you very much. Now, I imagine that when Professor Michael Sandel first became a philosopher nearly 50 years ago, that he didn't imagine it would make him a global superstar. His course, though, at Harvard became one of the best attended in history, which is perhaps why the university decided to put his justice course uh, online. It was the university's first freely available online course, and it's been viewed by tens of millions of people around the world. When he went to South Korea, 14,000 people turned up at a, a, an outdoor amphitheater to engage with his public dialogue. He's filled St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He's filled Australia's Sydney Opera House. He is a wreath lecturer. He's also behind the BBC series, The Public Philosopher. Even China, a decade ago, named him as the most influential foreign figure of the year. But then Professor Sandel has a way of taking ideas that we are all, we think we're all very familiar with and making you see them in a completely different light. And that's, what exactly, that's exactly what he's done in his latest book, which we're going to discuss, The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good. Now, some of you watching have kindly submitted actually some brilliant questions, so I'm going to feed them into our discussion, but I think we should not assume any knowledge. So, Professor Sandel, I want to start, if I may, with the thesis. Why the tyranny of merit? What's wrong with meritocracy? Well, first, thank you, Sarah, for being in conversation. This is a great treat for me. Merit, we normally think of as a good thing. If I need surgery, I want a well-qualified doctor to perform it. So how can merit become a tyranny? Well, here's how. In recent decades, the divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, setting us apart. This has, I think, partly to do with growing inequalities of income and wealth, but not only that. I think, Sarah, it has also to do with changing attitudes towards success that have come with it. Those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing and that they therefore deserve the bounty the market showers upon them. And by implication, that those who struggle, those left behind must deserve their fate as well. This way of thinking about success arises from the seemingly attractive ideal of merit. Meritocracy says if everyone starts at the same starting line, if chances are truly equal, then the winners deserve their winnings. So it's possible to see how this way of thinking about success leads to meritocratic hubris among the winners, a tendency to inhale too deeply of their own success, and a kind of demoralization, even humiliation among those who lose out. And it, I think it's the combination of a kind of market triumphalist faith and a meritocratic way of explaining who lands on top and who struggles that has fed 
the anger and resentment among many working people that uh, authoritarian populists, including Donald Trump, were able to exploit, Sarah. Okay, but if I think about most people I know, I think they tend to have an attitude of there but for the grace of God go I. They recognize that it's an element of luck in where they are. Are you saying that that's not the case or not widely enough the case? Well, you hang out with generous spirited people, it sounds. But if you look at the basic frame of our public discourse and the underlying moral attitudes towards success, uh, then I think it's possible to see how these rather harsh attitudes toward those who are left behind can be generated. And uh, it's coupled with something else, which has to do with higher education. Because during this time when inequalities were widening, what we heard from mainstream parties and politicians was the following response. Rather than deal directly with the inequalities of income and wealth and power, what they said, and this was across the political spectrum, what politicians told those who struggled with stagnant wages and job loss was, if you wanna compete and win in the global economy, go to university. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. These slogans became meritocratic mantras almost. And what they missed, these mainstream parties and politicians, was the insult implicit in this bracing advice. Because if you haven't been to university and if you're struggling in the new economy, the implication is your failure is your fault. So this way of thinking and, and of elites looking down is almost built into the structure of the argument and Sarah of the offer. So is there something, could you give us an example of where you've noticed that the hubris of the winners, shall we say, some evidence of what you're talking about? At the political level, I think many of the policies of austerity that we've seen in both of our countries, including after the financial crisis, reflected the idea that you can make it if you try, and if you don't make it, you simply haven't tried. It's a rather harsh notion of individual responsibility for one's fate. It flatters the winners because it tells them you did it on your own, but it also insults and demoralize, demoralizes those who lose out. But here's, here's something closer to home that I've noticed, Sarah. Over the years, I've noticed subtly changing attitudes among my students who work desperately hard and are subject to tremendous pressures to achieve throughout their adolescence to compete for admissions to competitive universities. And so, I, and I have noticed that my students do tend to believe that their admission, their success in winning admission, say to Harvard, is the result mainly of their effort and hard work. It's understandable because of the enormous pressures and anxieties that attend the years uh, preparing to compete for admission. But meritocratic intuitions, I find, run deep. It doesn't mean that they have no concern for the disadvantaged. There is very high level of public service activity. That's true. But the underlying idea is that I earned and therefore deserve my place or by extension, the advantages that will flow to me once I graduate with this degree. Now, in, in your book, you engage actually with all the ways that the system is rigged. So to suggest that perhaps they didn't deserve their place. Right. But, but in a way, it's almost like you're setting out, well, at one point I'm thinking, are you saying that we shouldn't try to make the playing field level? Are we on chasing something that isn't gonna resolve the problem anyway? I think we should continue to try to level the playing field, no question about it. 
Equality of opportunity is important. No one should be held back by prejudice or disadvantage. But we need to realize that equality of opportunity is a remedial principle. It's not a sufficient condition of a just society. We could have perfectly equal opportunity if, if ever we could achieve it and still fall short both of a just society and of a good society. Because paradoxically, the truer the meritocracy to the principles it proclaims, the harsher the judgment it imposes on those who fall short. And the person who first glimpsed this, at least one of them, was the person who coined the term meritocracy, Michael Young, back in the late 1950s. He, when, when he laid out his account of the emerging meritocracy in Britain, he did not see it as an ideal to aim at. He saw it as a dystopia. But before long, it became an ideal. And we, we became, I think the winners of globalization became complacent in asserting that if all we need to do is level the playing field and then our moral responsibilities to the less advantaged will be fulfilled. In my book, I dispute that idea. But you make the point in your book how it has become so widespread across the political spectrum in, in well, many countries. Can, can yes. I just get you to engage, though, with the effect of this? Because you mentioned that you think Donald Trump has benefited from recognizing this. <clears throat> but And do you see that? I just wonder what wider effects you see that it's had on all societies. I mean, the example, obviously, you use a lot in the book is the United States. But do you see it in other countries? I do. In fact, it's striking that center-left parties, the Democratic Party in the United States, the Labour Party in Britain, and social democratic parties in Europe have been the primary targets and uh, casualties of the authoritarian populist backlash against elites. And by around 2016, with the vote for Brexit in the UK, and with the vote with Trump's election in the US, these parties, and by these parties, I mean the center left mainstream parties, had become parties primarily attuned to the values and interests and outlook of the professional classes those with college degrees, the successful, and increasingly were losing contact with, had alienated, had alienated the working class voters who once constituted their primary base of support. This reversal, the loss of support by center left parties of, work, of the working class we see in the US, we see in Britain, we see in the social, socialist parties in France, we see in the SDP in Germany, all of these parties are struggling in part because they have embraced a kind of neoliberal market-based meritocratic ethic and outlook. They've been unable to deal effectively with the inequality and wage stagnation of recent decades. And they have projected a kind of elitism or meritocratic hubris that has antagonized a great many working class voters who have turned often not to traditional mainstream center-right parties, but to uh, xenophobic hyper-nationalist parties. And I, I think we see this in a great many democracies. Because this, is, and, and what your suggestion would be that politicians are misdiagnosing the problem. Yes. But actually what those who are humiliated by the meritocratic system are what railing against elites because they have been humiliated? Yes, uh, yes. And uh, Donald Trump constantly attacked elites. And in one speech uh, after a primary election victory, he said, I love the poorly educated. Now, this may have seemed a kind of comic stray remark, but it's revealing. Because what the elites, the meritocratic elites miss in their advice, go to university, then through individual upward mobility, you will surmount the barriers of inequality and wage stagnation. What they miss is that most people 
in our societies do not have a university degree. In the US, nearly two thirds do not have a four year university degree. The figures are similar in the UK and in most European countries. So it's folly to create an economy that sets as a necessary condition of dignified work and a decent life, a university degree that most people don't have. And so I suggest a shift, perhaps maybe you'll want to know what, I uh, what should <laughs> politics be about instead. I do, but, but in a way, before, before we come on to what your prescription is, what the solution right. is, um, I, I actually want to bring in um, a question, which, I mean, the way I'd phrase it is what, you know, is how dangerous a moment we are at in a way, oh. is whether this is having a, an effect on democracy. I mean, the, there's a question who's asked it in a far more sophisticated way than, than I, I, I've asked it, because he, he actually talks about is, is what we're seeing, meritocracy, the most significant factor that transforms current society into an M-shaped society, which we might need to explain, but I think it's probably safer if you explain it than I do. And whether this is, if, it's the, if the middle class is the foundation of democracy, will there be a failure on democratic consolidation because of meritocracy? The short answer I would give is yes. And to the, to the question you asked at the outset, how dangerous a moment is this? I would say very dangerous. I think we have in the US and perhaps uh, those looking to the US, a sense of false reprieve from the threat to democratic norms represented by hyper-nationalist, authoritarian, anti-elitist uh, uh, parties and figures. Because uh, Joe Biden managed to defeat Donald Trump. And it's interesting to, to note that Joe Biden was the first Democratic nominee for president, Sarah, in 36 years without a degree from an Ivy League prestigious university. He went to state universities. This, I think, was a kind of secret source of strength for Biden partly because it enabled him to connect a bit more easily with the working class voters the Democrats have struggled to attract in recent decades, but also because it made him less oriented to what I call in the book, the rhetoric of rising, the meritocratic political agenda. He's spoken a bit more about the dignity of work, which I think is a more promising way of framing the challenge presented by inequality. But I think it could be a temporary reprieve because I don't think that the Democratic Party in the US or the Labour Party in Britain or the Social Democratic Parties in Europe have yet figured out that they have the wrong diagnosis and that they for need to reflect critically on their own political project over recent decades and to recognize how they are complicit in laying the groundwork for the backlash that now threatens democratic norms. Okay, which I mean, you're making it sound like we are at a very dangerous point in, in different countries. I mean, in, in what way, if it isn't addressed, and we'll get on to what you think needs to in a minute, what do you fear will happen? I think that figures like Trump and other hyper-nationalist figures. One thinks, for example, also of Marie Le Pen in France, who will likely be the primary opponent of Macron. I think that figures like this and political movements like the Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, um, far-right, hyper-nationalist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant, anti-democratic parties will uh, continue to be a very significant force in the politics of democratic societies. And we've seen already how uh, with the January 6th attack on the US Capitol, we've seen the lengths to which these forces can, can go in threatening democracy. That's my worry, Sarah. Okay, so I've been holding you off giving us the solution. Tell us, what do you think needs to be done now? Right. And I, I should begin by saying I don't have a solution in the sense of a set of policy prescriptions that would put this danger to rest once and for all. But I do think we need to change the terms of public discourse. 
uh, we should start by focusing less on arming people for meritocratic competition. We should not consider that it's an, a sufficient response to inequality simply to offer individual upward mobility through higher education. That doesn't help most people. We should focus instead on the dignity of work. How can we create conditions and policies that enable people not only uh, to rise if they're able to go to university, but also to flourish in place as they are with the credentials they have perhaps enlarged and supported by greater support for forms of education that those without a university diploma need and want to flourish. Uh, su greater support for uh, apprenticeship and technical and vocational training. In the US, to give you one example, we spend $160 billion a year helping people go to university and about 1 billion uh, supporting vocational and technical training. The Germans do better at this than we do. It's not just about money and investment though. It's also about social recognition and esteem because this goes to the heart of the problem about attitudes towards success. I think we should, we should try to undo the steep hierarchy of esteem that distinguishes university graduates, especially from prestigious places in your country and mine, from people who, get, who learn trades, for example, electricians, plumbers, and certainly care workers. I think we need to find, and here in the book, I talk about contributive justice. It isn't just a matter of trying to uh, shore up the purchasing power of those who suffered stagnant wages. We also need to increase the respect and the dignity and the esteem and the social recognition accorded those who make valuable contributions to the common good, but whose work is not appreciated these days. Well, if we haven't had a wake up call with the pandemic and, and key workers and suddenly realizing the importance of delivery drivers and shopkeepers, but it makes me think that given that we're talking and, and certainly politicians have talked all along about the equality of opportunity, one naturally thinks, well, maybe we should be looking towards equality of outcome or at least raising the minimum wage, perhaps introducing a maximum wage. Are those the sort of things that could address it? Raising the minimum wage, yes, that would be a very important, tangible first step toward according greater dignity uh, to the work performed by the people we are now calling key workers. And if I could just pick up on the very important points you made, it goes right to the heart of this, this shift of political frame and discourse. Those of us, who during the pandemic had the luxury of working from home, couldn't help but notice how deeply we depend on workers we often overlook. Delivery workers, warehouse workers, lorry drivers, care workers. These are not the best paid or most honored workers in our society, but now we are calling them key workers, essential workers. So this could be a moment for a broader public debate about how to bring their pay and recognition into better alignment with the importance of the work they do. Beyond the minimum wage though, I think we need, and beyond support for the kind of a job training that would be required, I think we need to look at the tax system and ask some fundamental questions about what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. We have outsourced that judgment to markets, but okay. markets get it wrong in ways that are all too, too so, obvious. So, so you would employ the tax system. It, do you have some sort of formula that you could think, that you would think, look, when you look at the inequality, the vast inequality that exists between the, you know, what people are paid and the wealth people have, do you have something that you think that's what we should be aiming towards, a different differential, a minimum and a maximum? I don't have a formula, but uh, except, for a morally more robust public debate about whose contributions matter most with concrete examples and concrete tax policy proposals to spur the debate. Let me give you a concrete example. 
uh, a care worker, a nurse. If we accept the labor market's verdict on whose contributions matter most to our society, the care worker and the nurse contribute hundreds of times less value to the common good than a hedge fund manager. But I think even the most ardent free market advocates would acknowledge that, that can't be right. That can't be right as a moral matter. So how could we, well, the minimum wage would be one example, but more than that, how could we frame a debate that reclaims from the market the question, what really counts as a valuable contribution to the common good? Here's one example. Suppose we have a debate about whether those who make uh, their money from dividends and capital gains, why should they be taxed at a lower rate in many instances than uh, the money people make through work, the work they do? That's a fundamental question. It has concrete implications for tax, but it also has big moral implications if we frame this as a political debate, not just about the burden of taxation, distributive justice, but also it's a debate about contributive justice. Who really is worthy of greater esteem than the market would seem to confer? And I would uh, add uh, as a further framing question about tax, what about a financial transactions tax? Much financial activity, arguably the majority of financial activity and finance has ballooned as a share of GDP and corporate profits, much of it has nothing to do with the basic social purpose of finance, which is to invest in the real economy, businesses, companies, factories, schools, hospitals, roads, and so on. Much of it consists of casino-like speculation on the future prices of often contrived derivatives and, and financial devices that has very little to do with economic growth, with productivity or with the common good. Isn't an, what a nurse does more valuable than that? Well, if we propose shifting taxation from work to say a financial transactions tax, Sarah, we could have that broader debate. It's not a formula, I admit. It's, uh, my argument is for something I think more ambitious than a formula, it's shifting the terms of public debate and bringing these moral questions more directly to bear. Okay, well, there, let me, a few questions from uh, the audience. With the trend of globalization, all of us inevitably have to compete with others from all over the world. Uh, they go on to say, however, merits and talents are not the decision we can make. So how do we reduce the resent from up, resentment from others who lack resources because of their socioeconomic status? I mean, there's a number of things wrapped up in there, but globalization is not going to go away and the competitive element of it isn't either. That's true, but there are many ways that countries uh, can, and terms on which countries can trade with one another. And it's up to the countries themselves how to deal with the fallout. We were told when the project of market-based or neoliberal globalization got going, we were told, yes, there will be winners and there will be losers, but the gains to the winners will be more than enough to offset, to compensate the loss to the losers. We were, we were told that through the 80s and 90s. But what happened was, Almost all of the gains went to the top 20%, and almost none of the gains from globalization in terms of uh, economic growth and productivity went to the bottom half or even 60% of the population. So the issue isn't whether countries should trade with one another or, or whether globalization uh, should proceed. The question is how to allocate the economic effects of new patterns of trade. And what's happened is the compensation hasn't occurred in part because uh, powerful economic interests who benefit from leaving the gains where they fall, where they lie, uh, have been able to capture political influence and power 
to prevent that happening. Okay, which brings me on to uh, another question. How do you change such deeply held beliefs around ideas of success when those in power are products of the system? Well, that's a very good question. And it isn't easy. Uh, I think that, uh, that we can reflect together in, in conversations and arenas like this to try to prompt a broader kind of public discourse. But I think it takes more than talk, uh, though I think reflection and, and public debate are crucial. It also takes social movements and social activism within civil society to begin to organize politics within civil society around some of these questions. Part of what's happened during the age of globalization to take one quite faithful example, is trade unions have lost a tremendous amount of power and influence. Um, and we need to find ways to give voice, effective, meaningful voice to working people and more broadly to those, to the 50 or 60% who have not gained much, if anything, of the bounty of the, the globalization that we've had in the over the last four decades. Okay, so there's another question, which the gist of which is what can individuals do apart from casting a considered political vote, perhaps? You would be urging people to, what, engage in social activism, which means what? Well, it means uh, rethinking our understanding of success for the successful. Let me address those of us who have been the winners, those who have succeeded, who have been the beneficiaries of the uh, globalization project and of the meritocratic way of allocating credentials and opportunities. Uh, partly it's a moral, we've been talking about political responses, Sarah, which are indispensable. But this is also a moral project. I, it seems to me, and part of the purpose of my book is to call upon those of us who have succeeded, been the beneficiaries of a meritocratic market-driven society to begin to reflect more than perhaps we do on the meaning of our own success, questioning our meritocratic hubris. Because it's easy. It's easy to become complacent, to forget the luck and good fortune that helped us on our way. It's tempting, powerfully tempting, to think of ourselves as self-made and self-sufficient, as the masters of our fate. But there's a dark side to that way of thinking about human agency. It leads us to forget our indebtedness to those who make our achievements possible, from parents to teachers to community, the country, to the times in which we live. And it also makes it hard for us to identify with those who struggle. An appreciation of the role of luck in life can prompt a certain humility. It's the attitude you mentioned earlier, Sarah, there, but for the luck of the draw or the accident of birth or the grace of God, there, that could be me, there go I. This humility. Yeah, but, uh, you know, as I was asking that, I was also thinking maybe this is an example of hubris. I'm think, oh, it's fine because I'm aware of it. But, you know, here I am sitting in my comfortable life. Well, and that raises the question, what is the connection between awareness or a shift in attitudes and values and the way we live our lives and the way we conduct our political debates? And the way we frame the public questions that democratic citizens should be focusing on, if all we focus on is offering those who struggle individual mobility through higher education, we are going to miss most people. We are going to fail to address the sense of resentment and exclusion that has uh, contributed powerfully to the backlash against elites and established parties that we were discussing earlier. So we have to find a way to connect 
shifting attitudes. Um, uh, I, I do think humility has become, is today an important missing civic virtue. Because I do think, especially if one looks at Silicon Valley or, or, at, the, uh, or at Wall Street or the city, uh, I think the attitudes of, of humility and, and uh, the appreciation of luck that you've described and that we've discussed may not be as plentiful as we might ideally um, expect or hope. But beyond shifting attitudes and values, I think we need to find ways to put them into practice to change the terms of political argument and of public discourse, Sarah. Okay, now there's a, a question from somebody who's from a religious Southeast Asian country. And they make the point that actually your book focuses quite a lot on the United States and other Western countries. But they ask, I wonder if there's any relevance of the growing meritocracy and the degree of religious belief of the society. Because I found that some people here believe that their success is partly luck and God-given, thus they should give back to the society and use their privilege for goodness. But I realize that more politicians are now using the rhetoric of rising in their campaign. So maybe this is only the beginning of the rising meritocratic thinking. What's the direct, for a Southeast Asian country, I mean, they don't say which one it is, but a religious Southeast Asian country, are they headed this awful route towards uh, this, uh, the, scenario, the scenario you set out about the West or are they on a different track? I think that's an open question. There are meritocratic uh, uh, strands in traditions of some Asian societies. And in the case of China, the, uh, the Communist Party of China invokes Confucian ideas about rule according to merit, by which they mean judgment and virtue, whether it actually corresponds to the facts on the ground is a further question. But there, there is a kind of Confucian strand of meritocratic tradition. And in the West, it's striking. And I try to lay out in the book, the prehistory of meritocracy is fascinating. And it's bound up with debates in Christianity about whether salvation is something that we earn by being faithful and observant and doing good works on earth, or whether salvation is an act of grace, an unearned act of grace. This debate between merit and grace, between earning and receiving as a gift, the things we most care about go all the way back to Christian debates about salvation and are replicated today in striking ways in our seemingly secular age when we're thinking about whether the, those who are wealthy and powerful deserve their wealth and power, or whether it's largely to do with luck or their having been very good at rigging the system. These are persisting human questions that reach across traditions, but that do have profound uh, origins in the various religious traditions. But, but your, your thoughts about the different religious traditions made me think that actually the Western world with the damage that you set out as being caused by uh, meritocracy, there might be some benefit to, to certain strands of religious thinking where people don't feel that, you know, it was a God-given talent, but that they owe back to the world. Well, uh, yes, owing back to the world. Uh, the phrase you just used is very powerful and suggestive. And it does seem to be looking at these various religious traditions. It does, owing back to the world does seem to be connected to the idea that much of what we receive, we receive as a gift. We don't make, we are not self-made and self-sufficient. Believing that we are self-made and self-sufficient tends to prevent us from feeling an obligation to give back to the world or to those who struggle. Whereas the sensibility of being in receipt of a gift, be they our talents or our life circumstances, or even the fact that we live at a time when people prize our talents, this sense of contingency and gift or grace in a religious idiom, I think does point toward a more generous stance and a greater sense of obligation 
to to those less gifted, less lucky than we. Another question from someone, um, and it, it, you were talking about social activism. And we've seen a very clear example of that through the last year with the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. And the questioner says, with the recent swell around Black Lives Matter, what are your thoughts on discussions around inequality linked to race in the context of meritocracy? I think the Black Lives Matter movement is one of the most promising and hopeful developments of this rather dark and difficult uh, last year and a half. Because with, uh, when George Floyd was murdered and there was an outpouring of support in America and in countries around the world for the Black Lives Matter movement, it really became a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational movement for social justice. And it, it's clear that its agenda cannot be only or mainly concerned with perfecting the meritocracy. That's import, an important element of racial justice providing truly equal opportunity and overcoming racism and disadvantage, but it's far from sufficient. What prompted the outpouring of support after all was the persistent violence by police officers against unarmed African-American men. So police violence, a very high incarceration rate, these are not questions that can be solved by perfecting the meritocracy. These are injustices that have to be dealt with directly. And so I think we need to take up questions of race, racial justice, but also economic justice together, not as separate cabined projects. And I think there is a tendency for uh, some, who have in, some who have enjoyed great success uh, in the economy to uh, say Trump's support comes only from his racism and the people who support him are only supporting him because they like his racism. I think that's too narrow a view, but more than that, it lets elites off the hook because it says the only problem is racism uh, that, that Trump is appealing to. And the problem is not that we've created an economy that doesn't meet the needs and in fact actually insults a great many people. So I think we need to think about racial justice and class and economic justice together, Sarah. Okay, um, I, I want to just return to one of your solutions, which is the idea of, of developing systems for those who don't, go, don't want to go to university, wouldn't be appropriate, and you suggest things like apprenticeships and investment in uh, more technical roles, using yeah. Germany as a good example. Aren't you just setting up a parallel meritocratic system in outside a the academic one? Well, merit is involved in the sense that those who do those jobs well, be they plumbers or nurses or dental hygienists or electricians, um, they will have merit and we will seek them out and should seek them out and appreciate them when they need, uh, when we need the kinds of services that they perform. However, what a greater emphasis on the dignity of work broadly conceived should aim at is to disperse social esteem and recognition to broaden the conception of what contributions to the economy truly matter, both with respect to pay and benefits and with respect to social recognition. In many ways, I think the anger and resentment, the grievances are not only about the pay, but also about social recognition and esteem. So uh, emphasizing technical and vocational training preparing people for trades, if it's combined with appreciating those career tracks. Here's a test. Here's one test, Sarah. It's a rather difficult one. How would we view it if our children came to us and said, I don't really want to go to university, 
I want to practice a trade or perform a service that requires another kind of practical training, but that is actually important and that is in line with my passion. How would we react as parents? That's, that's one test because it's a measure of how the broader society recognizes and respects different callings, different vocations. Uh, we've skipped over a lot of subjects, economy, racism, God. We haven't really talked about the nation state. Yeah. And in a way, Brexit was about, in part, about sovereignty. Yeah. And, and of course, we have a prime minister who then talks about leveling up. And I wonder whether you see that, I mean, particularly since some of the, the challenges are from globalization, whether this uh, a return to sovereign control of a nation is actually helpful in terms of the sort of things we're talking about. It's a complicated and important question, Sarah. I would say that what we can learn from the desire for sovereignty that finds expression uh, in Brexit and finds dark problematic expression in the xenophobic strands that we've seen in the, in the politics of some uh, right-wing populists. Sovereignty is at stake, national sovereignty, but there's more to the, to the appeal of the nation than sovereignty itself. There's also the question of identity and community, patriotism. You mentioned earlier how some of the center-left parties have lost credibility with a uh, great many working class people. And I think this has partly to do with their embracing the globalization project in a way that also implicitly embraced the superiority of cosmopolitan identities, cosmopolitan global identities at the expense of national community and responsibility. And part of what I think makes people feel that elites were out of touch is the sense that those elites had more in common with their professional counterparts, their meritocratic credentialed counterparts, half a world away than with the people around the block or who lived on their street. And that the, and that the special kind of care and commitment to one's fellow citizens and to the national community was was attenuated at best and maybe disparaged implicitly. So I think any uh, renewal, uh, democratic renewal, has to have an account of the role of national community, national identity. And the talk of national sovereignty, I think, has this morally textured uh, uh, gesture that all democratic parties, but uh, center-left parties in particular, need to rethink and reconsider and, and, and to articulate a sense. To be able to speak the language of patriotism without ceding patriotism to the right and to xenophobia and to narrowness and to intolerance, it doesn't need to be that way. The borders are good. The, sorry, the, the border. I said borders well, are good. Well, borders, borders provided there's a certain porousness uh, to borders. Borders stand for the long-standing aspiration of people to have a meaningful say, not just in their own individual lives, but in the, in the life of their community and its destiny. And it's hard for us to be democratic citizens if our only identities our global cosmopolitan identities, important though those identities are for matters of human rights and, and dealing with global warming and, and all the rest. We also, if the democratic project, I guess, uh, Sarah, I would say borders matter to the democratic project insofar as borders signify the special responsibilities and obligations that we owe to those with whom we share a common life. And it's the common life that has been eroded and attenuated by the harsh ethic of success 
of a market-driven, meritocratic political project. Now, I can't talk to a, uh, to a philosopher of your standing without asking you what in a way is one of, probably one of the hardest ethical philosophical questions that certainly the UK is about to grapple with, which is about deciding to extend the vaccination program against COVID uh, to, to children, to teenagers. And the reason I'm, I'm curious about this, because in a way it's, I, I wondered if, if in a sense it was an example of the downside of meritocracy, that we uh, as a society are wrestling with, do we vaccinate our teenagers or do we give vaccines to people on the other side of the world? And I wonder how you see this, because it is a, it's peculiar to this, well, it's peculiar to a pandemic and the nature of herd immunity and no one's safe till everyone's safe, that actually that applies first within borders. So I'm just curious whether you have an answer to what a country should do. Not a good and easy answer, Sarah, except to say that the question is a question of enormous moral importance and one that we have largely ignored or not ignored, We've answered it implicitly. The rich countries have bought up most of the vaccines. And we could have asked this very same question even before it came to the matter of vaccinating teenagers. Once we vaccinated our healthcare workers and elderly populations most at risk of dying, we could have asked then, should we now make the vaccines we have at our disposal in the rich countries available first to vaccinate the healthcare workers and those most at risk in other parts of the world. At every stage, and now the question can arise with regard to teenagers, at every stage, that, that's a morally serious question. I would say, um, ideally, that we would have had a greater measure of sharing for frontline healthcare workers everywhere. But and the practicalities of nation states are such that, just as you say, borders do matter. I do think we have special obligations to our fellow citizens. Problem is, those of us who live in rich countries can enact those special obligations by vaccinating everyone, including teenagers, whereas those who live in poor countries can't even manage to vaccinate yet their, their health workers, frontline workers. So from the standpoint of justice and global justice, that's a problem. That's morally a problem. But from the standpoint of Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. I, I just wondered if it was trite to consider it also as an example of what you're talking about with meritocracy. That, uh, well, of course we should use them on ourselves. After all, you know, Britain developed, distributed, you know, one of the main vaccines in the world. Yes. Um, and it's, so we can justifiably use it on us, ourselves first. We deserve it. Well, have you, it, that is a possible rationale. Have you actually heard much of that lurking beneath the surface? Uh, I don't know. Uh, have you? I haven't. Now, this may partly be because we really haven't had much public debate or deliberation about this question, uh, and we should have done. Uh, I think it's less uh, the I, maybe there is some of that, Sarah, that, well, we de deserve it. We developed these vaccines. It was our ingenuity and so on. Therefore, uh, and we bought them. We funded them, we invested, therefore we bought them, therefore we are ours. I think that if, if you broaden the assumption, the possessive assumption to include the investments that we've made, then yes, I think that is a powerful current um, in countries like ours, uh, justifying our helping our own people first. I don't think that's a sufficient justification. I think we should uh, recognize the practicalities that uh, we're organized as nation states 
and and those that have it are not politically able to uh, deny their own citizens for the sake of global justice. But we should be aware, we shouldn't let that awareness completely absolve us of the tension or the worry or the thought that maybe there's a better way to do it. Here's why this matters, Sarah. It matters, it's not gonna change really the pattern of vaccine distribution. Countries, rich countries will vaccinate their people first, even though some now are donating to COVAX and so on. But here's where it really matters. In our attitudes toward intellectual property rights and whether we should um, waive intellectual property rights on the vaccine, enable generic drug developers in India and Brazil and other places that are set up for this to mass produce these vaccines, so-called our so-called quote unquote our vaccines. That I do think is a tangible way of giving expression to this broader uh, sense of global justice. And we are very reluctant to do that. A final thought, you paint a pretty gloomy scenario when you're talking about the false reprieve of uh, President Biden being elected, a dangerous moment because the solutions, the political class doesn't recognize the solutions to the concerns you lay out. So are you pessimistic about what is gonna happen to the democratic world? I would distinguish Sarah between uh, optimism and hope. I'm not optimistic because I think that the forces in play and the anger abroad in the land persists unaddressed. So I am not optimistic, but I do have hope. And the hope consists in, well, we spoke about the Black Lives Matter movement and other social movements, rethinking that the pandemic may have prompted about the important contribution made by key workers and how ill-supported they are. And maybe that can point us to a broader public debate. The other source of hope is I find a restlessness, especially among the younger generation with the existing, the, the, the existing hollow terms of public discourse. I, I find wherever I go, especially talking to young people, a hunger for something better, a better kind of pub, uh, uh, of public discourse that addresses more directly the kinds of questions we've been discussing today. What makes for a just society? What do we owe one another as citizens? What should be the role of the nation state in a global society? What should be the role of reach and markets? What does it mean to be a democratic citizen? So the hunger is there. The question is whether we, by we, I mean those of us, not only in politics, but in education, in the media, in civil society, can find a way to shift the terms of public discourse, to rebuild class mixing institutions in our everyday life, so that this hunger, this desire for a better kind of public discourse could begin to find some public expression. Professor Michael Sandel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. But before I turn to the, the formal vote of thanks, just a reminder to the audience that today's focus day is about democracy debate and disagreement. And Michael has laid out, as Sarah was just saying, both the degree of fragmentation and the degree of danger at this very moment. So please join us later today at two o'clock when we talk about news, fake news and calling it out with speakers including Dorothy Byrne of Channel 4, formerly of Channel 4 News, and then at five o'clock on the future of liberalism with Timothy Garton Ash. Now let me turn to the vote of thanks. It's slightly peculiar to give a vote of thanks after that lecture because of course we now know, if we agree with Michael and I think we should, that uh, Sarah's forensic intelligence and Michael's erudition are as much down to luck as down to their in intrinsic merits. But fortunately, I don't have to decide on their market remuneration. I just have to be a good host and thank them. 
uh, and it is easy to thank them. I, I'm not often starstruck, but as a, as a lifelong listener to, to Radio 4, I am so conscious of how uh, grateful we should be in this country to have journalists like Sarah, and I'm so pleased that she could join us today. I started my PhD in political philosophy at the heyday of what was then called the liberal and communitarianism debate in which Michael was a significant player. So he's been on my desk in, in book form and in other forms for all of my professional life. Um, I think you'll all agree with me. It was obvious today why he's not only made a name for himself amongst professional philosophers, but has succeeded where many of us have failed in bringing philosophy genuinely to the people. And that's not just because he is so good at communicating. It's also because he's so good at applying philosophy to real world problems, whether that's problems of meritocracy or of why we shouldn't have markets in organs and so on. He has many, many books and they're all worth reading. I am so grateful to you, Michael, for coming. For those of you in the audience who want to read his latest book, please do go to the York Festival of Ideas bookseller, foxlanebooks.co.uk and follow the Festival of Ideas link. And all that remains for me now is to thank you, the audience, for attending today and hope that you'll be able to join us later for more democracy, debate and disagreement. Thank you very much.